opening hymn is hymn number 530. Or sorry, 529. It's over. of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all of his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. We will recite this psalm responsibly by half verse. Your word is a lantern to my feet. And a light on my path. I have sworn and am determined. To keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips. And teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand. Yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me. But I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes. Forever and to the end. <clears throat> A reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what is sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, 
and it yields nothing. But as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I'm coming to understand a little bit more as I traverse another year, I think. The life that we live is often this delicate balance of ourself and the other in our midst. Many of us know people, and maybe we are among them. It's easy to look out for number one. It's easy to look out for me because I know what I need and I'm willing to most of the time say what it is that I need. It is harder for most people to self-reflect in the relationships that they have and especially when things don't work like they expect them to. It's hard for people to do the hard work of figuring out what's going on both in the story and in their life and then in those around them. It is especially hard when we deal with people we know well and, probably more importantly, those who know us. Because it's hard to pull one over on somebody who knows us even if they don't really know us. And of course the challenge of my early life was punctuated by sibling rivalries, both real and imagined, and yes there are differences. But in the process of learning about my sibling rivalry and doing the process and the work, I've learned about me and who I am and what makes me who I am and what helps me keep moving forward in the world of God, in the world that God has placed me in. And so I ask us a question this morning as we begin this journey. What are the marks of life as we understand it? Well, we have at least two or three different ways which we can consider our life. We have the biological process of life. And as I have been told at least a couple of times recently, the moment we stop doing things is the moment we stop having life. Philosophically, we have the mark of life as the sense of hope that we have for today or tomorrow or maybe somewhere down the road. And of course, socially, the marks of the life that we live is, is the way that we be, or that that's a tough word to say, the way that we are in community, or our being. Recently, I've been having some conversations with my doctors, and I have confided in him that I am starting to slow down just a little. But I'm still doing what I can. But I'm being attentive to me and what I'm being told by my body, you can't do that anymore, is often what the body tells me. <laughs> and the doctor's response is, movement is life. Or another way, a life is found in experience in the struggle. And as part of this ongoing process of coming to grips with my life well spent, I'm back at the physical therapist. And I would say that physical therapy without resistance is difficult because you tend to lose your form if you aren't focused and if you aren't concentrating. 
You can't just let the muscle memory carry you because the muscle memory is what got you into the mess that you're in already. And PT is hard for me and for most people because we move from a place of comfort and disorder and self-assurance to a place of discomfort and questioning and having to recalibrate and rethink how we live and how we act and what we do. And we like to hold on to the known and the comfortable. But there is a cost at hanging on, or cost for hanging on. And yet hanging on is human. It's what we do because we like to have some control. Looking around, most of us are real people. Real people. We're simple. Not simple in mind, but we're direct. We're mostly transparent. Thankfully, we have good examples in the Bible of the real people that God chooses to do God's work and to carry God's message to the world. And today we hear the story of the sibling rivalry, Jacob and Esau. There is little known specifically enumerating who and what they are, but more details probably wouldn't improve the story that we heard this morning. Jacob and Esau struggling in the womb Jacob grabbing Esau's heel. Jacob, Esau being impatient. They are caricatures. They are short-sighted and oafers. They are shrewd, conniving, and self-serving. Esau is the impatient one. He wants what he wants when he wants it, without considering the cost or the implications. Give me some of that red stuff doesn't even know what he's eating. He just wants something to eat. And Jacob is the patient one. He knows what he wants or what he thinks he wants. He creates a plan. He creates a method by which he achieves his goals and he sets himself up for success as he understands it. The end for Esau. He gives up something, a great gift, that he has been given without cost for something of little consequence and of little benefit. He couldn't see the necessity and the benefit of something that would happen later. He wanted his food and he wanted it now. He stopped being who he was by right and nature for something else which will be ultimately in his life unsatisfying. And in today's story, the end for Jacob is a life of toil and unpredictability, of hard work to fulfill his calling. Because Jacob will, in fact, be the father of nations, but he will run away from his family. He will suffer through the sibling rivalry with his brother. He will have to learn how to balance the knowledge and compassion with respect to the family and those who he is close to while still striving to get something which he thinks and knows that he wants. And if we're honest with ourselves, we, we are smack dab in that Genesis story. We experience subterfuge, either us against the other or the other against us. We try to convince others of things which are not exactly the way that we want them, but we're trying to get people to do our bidding. And likewise, others are trying to pull one over on us. There are people in our society who prey on weakness, or worse, we allow our weakness to be to, uh, we allow our weakness to let us be preyed upon by somebody who we feel is stronger. We in our society are looking for the short-term rewards most often over the meaningful change that takes time and effort. We have become a society which depends upon itself to come up with the right plan to succeed and the, as opposed to the plan that we are called to participate in with, God's, and with and by God's grace. So what gifts do we have today which are, present, are at play in our present reality? And what are the responsibilities that we have based upon that reality that we find ourselves in? God depends upon us to be an essential part of God's work in the world. 
and I won't mince words on that. God depends upon us to do God's work in the world. We only have to trust that God has a plan and that God's plan will succeed. We must trust that God will connect us with those whom we need to help us achieve God's goal or who God will expose us to those who will be the ones who can do their part in God's plan in our world and in our community and in this church. We need to remember that our greatest enemy that we have is fear of the unknown or the unexpected. But God tells us time and again that God is with us. God will not let our short-sightedness be our end unless we let it be. God will be patient as we search, act, assess, and reformulate the next step and the step beyond that and the step beyond that based on the prayer and discernment, looking for God's guidance in our life. We are reminded again today that God does not expect perfection. Esau and Jacob, just like their forebears, were a mess emotionally, psychologically, and socially. Yet Jacob, Esau, and their forebears are the ones who we are called to model our lives after. The lives of our faith is how we, we are called to be like them, trusting, direct, and open. The lives that we use to learn to let go and let God be the one who fulfills our deepest desire and need. The challenges that we see today most often are, the, are numerous, but we realize sometimes, or we forget sometimes, that we are real people, regular people, just like Jacob and Esau. But honestly, I've come to understand that God works best with regular people. God sets people who are willing to listen and trust that God will provide what, what they need into places where they will succeed because we are God's instruments and God's workers in the world. So I ask us, who do we know that can learn from our struggles for relevance and sustenance? Who is it that can teach us about life with God in their struggles and in their sustenance? And how they've survived through the time of trouble and toil. We really don't need to look far because there are people that we meet each and every day people just like us, people who are on our doctor staff, people who are out there in the world that we run into periodically, we can talk to them and share with them our faith in God and what God offers us. The things that we've been given are, need to be retained, to be shared, and to provide strength for those whom we meet and those and ourselves. We have been given gifts that God wants us to use to do God's work in the world. The things that we have and that we have learned to appreciate, the acceptance of who we are and what makes us who we are, the space that God has given us in this church and on this property and the neighbors that we have and the people that we meet day in and day out. And most importantly, the wisdom to hear God's voice in our lives and to share what we know with others. The point that I think we need to take home with us today is God wants us to hold on to the best gift, that is, the relationship that we have with God, the one that costs us absolutely nothing, God's grace and God's forgiveness, and then most importantly, it is our job to share God's grace and forgiveness for ourselves, for our communities, and for the world. God puts us in places where we are the only ones who can do God's work. And where might that be for you today and forever? Amen. Amen.
please stand as you are able, and turning to page six in the order of worship, let us recite the Nicene Creed, our ancient confession of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs> prayers of the people. Lest the word of God return empty to the heavens, let us turn our hearts to the needs of others and plant the seeds of justice, saying, in mercy hear us. For the Christian churches throughout the world, that together we may harvest compassion in an abundance of mercy, we pray. In mercy hear us that leaders of governments around the world refuse to worship Mars, the god of war, but rather attend to Christ's call of peace, we pray. In mercy, hear us. For farmers, harvesters, and migrant workers, and for the end of injustice towards those who work the land, we pray. In mercy, hear us that the people of the earth may honor and respect the natural resources of the planet and for the end of consumerism that encourages ravage, we pray. In your mercy, hear us. And the catahumas in our communities, that fertile in faith that they may be a soil rich for in receptivity, we pray. In your mercy, hear us. <coughs> For all the sick, especially those on our prayer list, and for all the oppressed, especially those in Ukraine, Russia, and Israel, and the West Bank, that the reign of God will hold sway in all human life. We pray. In mercy, hear us. Blessed and praised are you, O God, for the word of your mouth. In your mercy, listen to all who call you in faith. Let your word find root in our, our lives. We pray in the name of your child, Jesus, who lives with you in the prayer, power of the Spirit forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ. Peace. Ascribe to the Lord the honors of his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Post-communion prayer is found on page 11 in your order of worship. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you all. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. Our closing hymn is hymn number 533.
our service is just beginning. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.